Hello from the University of Miami in Coral Gables. My name is Louise Davidson Schmich, and I'm a professor of political science here at UM. And I'd like to welcome you today to a roundtable discussion on Germany, the United States, and the challenges of pandemic. Some of you watching will probably remember that I, along with my colleague Marcus Thiel at Florida International University, and with the generous support of the German government, organized a roundtable series in the 2018-2019 academic year about Germany, the United States, and the challenges of the 21st century. Um, you can watch these recorded roundtables from the past on our YouTube channel. Um, that series sought to examine things that the United States and Germany had in common and that would present a challenge for them in the 21st century. These roundtables focused on topics including retaining a robust economy, promoting gender equality, protecting the environment, incorporating immigrants, and dealing with political polarization. This was a, a wonderful experience and lots of people expressed that they really enjoyed the different roundtables. When the series was, was over, a number of people came up to me or emailed me and said, oh, I really enjoyed this. I wanna come next year. Please let me know when the next roundtable is gonna be. And I told everyone at the time, I hate to disappoint you, but this is part of the Wunderbar Together program, which is the year of German-American friendship. It's just a year, there's no more roundtables. Um, and people were disappointed, and I was disappointed too, but I also sort of felt a little smug that, well, Mar Marcus and I planned this series so well, we really talked about all the challenges these two countries were gonna be facing in the 21st century, and there's not really too much left to say. Well, 2020 proved me wrong on both of those counts. Um, we hadn't anticipated that both countries were going to be dealing with a deadly pandemic, um, and we also didn't anticipate that the German embassy in Washington, D.C. would extend its Wunderbar Together program um, and offer us the opportunity to come together again for a roundtable discussion on the pandemic as part of its 2020 Campus Weeks Building Tomorrow program. Um, so we're very, very thankful that we have this opportunity sponsored by the German embassy um, to come together and talk about some new and challenging issues that both of the countries are facing. Um, and we have a great lineup of speakers for you today. Um, we have with us Mr. Andreas Siegel, who is the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany to Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And he's going to be discussing how the, German, um, how the Germans have dealt with the challenges of pandemic. Um, we also have today with us Dr. Zinzi Bailey, um, who's an assistant scientist coming to us from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine's J. Weiss Institute for Health Equity, which is located at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And she's gonna be talking about the challenges that the United States has faced combating the virus. Um, we also have with us today my colleague, Dr. Marcus Thiel, Associate Professor of Politics and International Relations at Florida International University and the Director of FIU's Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. He'll be talking about the European Union's um, responses to the pandemic. We also have with us from FIU, Mr. David Kramer, who's a Senior Fellow in the Vaclav Havel Program for Human Rights and Dep Diplomacy, and the director of the Center for European and Eurasian Studies at FIU. And he's going to be talking about the impact of the pandemic on human rights and democracy more broadly. Finally, our last speaker that we have with us today is my colleague from the University of Miami Department of Political Science, Dr. Brian Blankenship, who's an assistant professor. Um, and he's gonna be talking to us today from Washington, D.C., where he's currently a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Council for Foreign Relations. And he's gonna be talking about the impact of the pandemic on alliance relationships and the transatlantic um, relationship. Following each person's individual presentation, we're gonna be having some questions that are being asked by our students at the University of Miami and at Florida International University. So each speaker will have an opportunity to respond to some of the concerns and some of the questions um, that young people on college campuses here in South Florida have today. Um, so before I turn the, the floor over to, Professor, uh, to Consul Siegel, what I would like to do is to just give you some very brief background about the events of 2020. Um, so you can see here on the next slide that Germans and Americans have been confronted with very similar challenges over the course of the past year. 
Over 300,000 Germans and over 7 million Americans have contracted the COVID-19 virus, and over 9,000 Germans and 200,000 Americans have died of this virus. Um, both countries have similar case fatality rates, so people as of October 2020 are, are um, dying of these, this disease if they catch it at similar rates. Um, so we can see we have common humanity, right? Our bodies in both countries are negatively affected by the same terrible disease. Um, and even people who are very politically powerful are not immune to this virus. Both countries have closed their borders to outsiders to stop the spread of disease. Both countries have seen their citizens' lives disrupted, citizens locked down and being unable to move about and assemble the way that they have been in the past. Schools have closed and working parents have faced great challenges trying to figure out how to care for children and do their work. Both countries' economies have suffered, um, and both countries have had disputes among their citizens about how best to respond to these challenges. And so in some respects, I think Marcus and I got it right. The kind of issues that we were concerned about before in our earlier roundtable, right, the challenges of um, environmental issues have really played out here. Where did this pandemic come from? It was transmitted from, humans, from animals to humans who are living in close, close quarters. Um, we talked about the challenges of immigration and integration and who's an insider and who's an outsider. Well, these questions have become really, really valid as we start to close down national borders. Um, we talked about changing gender roles um, and the roles played by parents in the home um, and men and women in the workplace. And again, these have, questions have been thrown in sharp relief uh, by closures of schools and the continuation of businesses. We've talked about how to keep our countries economically competitive, and both countries have faced challenges in these regards. Um, and finally, we talked about increasing political polarization, um, a gap between um, populist parties and more mainstream um, democratic parties. And we've seen all of these issues playing out here in the pandemic. And I have a couple slides that illustrate some of these points that I talked about. Here we can see the sharply negative trends um, in both the German and the American economy. Um, on our next slide, we can see um, evidence that even the most powerful among us are not immune to this virus. Chancellor Merkel um, was exposed to the virus and went into self-isolation. President Trump contracted the virus and was hospitalized. Um, if we look at our next slide, we can see that in both countries, most citizens are heeding public health advice. Most citizens are wearing masks in public. These figures here on the graph show a gray line for Germany and a black line for the United States, where majorities of people in both countries are wearing masks. Uh, but in both countries, vocal minorities are um, opposed to some of the public health measures that have been taken and have challenged them, as we can see uh, from these pictures of protest here. Um, so very, very similar uh, challenges and in some degree, very, very similar um, responses in both countries. Um, but on the other hand, we can see some sharp differences, which our next two slides depict. Um, so the next slide looks at the con cumulative confirmed COVID-19 cases per million people in each country. So the United States is a much bigger country than Germany. So part of the reason why we have a lot more cases is simply because we have a lot more people. But if we adjust these numbers and look at rates of infection per million people, we can see that while the countries started off in the first quarter of this year with hardly anyone sick, um, and while both countries have seen increases in the rates of illness, we can see that the rates of infection in the United States are much, much higher. Um, and if we look at our next slide, we can also look at um, confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people. And again, we can see some sharp differences between the countries um, in terms of the, the um, number of citizens per million who have fallen to this virus. Um, and so part of our discussion today will be try to explain these similarities and these differences and to think about which what each country um, can learn from the other. So I'm going to stop my introduction now, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Consul General Andreas Siegel. He's a career diplomat with a broad range of international experience in strategic, political, economic, and cultural affairs. He holds degrees from the College of Europe and the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, and he was also an AFS exchange student in Michigan in the 1970s. Um, and prior to his posting in Miami, he served in Berlin, Boston, Belgium, France, 
Malawi, Morocco, Poland, and Vietnam. So he brings to us a wealth of experience um, as a diplomat, and he'll be talking about Germany's response to the pandemic. So hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to contribute to this interesting and challenging uh, topic. Uh, the challenge of COVID is still with us. Uh, we are in the second or third wave, and that does concern all parts of the world, uh, Germany included, of course, and the United States. So I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the challenges that we faced in political and economic, and of course, in health uh, terms, and what, uh, what, what effects that might have on our transatlantic trans, um, relations as well. So as was pointed out uh, in the in introduction, uh, Germany fared comparatively well uh, in, in this, at least in the first wave. We're now experiencing a second one. Uh, we had also some luck, one has to say. First of all, uh, we had a, a very a distinguished epidemiologist who is a specialist on SARS uh, virus. Uh, and he uh, was very er early on involved, uh, not only in, uh, in uh, <coughs> composing a, a testing uh, procedure, but also in communication on the virus. And he was very much um, sort of a unifying factor in the communication on the virus and on the behavior. His name is Drosten. He also uh, then uh, sort of had a daily podcast on the on the radio where people were informed from a scientific perspective uh, on uh, what all the impacts and uh, possibilities and the facets of this virus were. So that again, uh, the the. The fact that we already had a test ready at the end of January, beginning of February, uh, and that in Germany we had clearly identifiable clusters in different parts of Germany, uh, which could then, then be isolated or tested, isolated, uh, so that the, uh, the key issue that we're still discussing today uh, to identify, tracing, the testing, tracing, and afterwards identifying any contacts. That is key uh, to, uh, to uh, hinder the propagation of the virus. So that happened early on in, in Germany in March, uh, approximately. And uh, as I said, there was a rather uh, overwhelmingly rational approach to this by politicians and by the media and by, by the people to some extent, because of course everyone was afraid of what was going to happen. Um, but then, as the United States, Germany is a federal state, so the authority on health measures, security measures, uh, is divided somehow between the federal and the state level. So that was an additional challenge, which initially uh, went not so well in Germany. Uh, but starting in April, there were, uh, or there have been, uh, regular coordination meetings between uh, the chancellor, so the, gov the government, and the state level uh, representatives in order to coordinate uh, the measures as far as possible. Nevertheless, we also had some difficulties, uh, in particular uh, also with decisions which were quite short term to uh, block. Uh, the borders uh, to the to the uh, uh, neighboring countries. Uh, in the end, uh, people were uh, seeing that these had some negative impact, not only on the on the political but also on the economic front. Um, and so, that coordination became better in the in the end. Uh, one f fact that we only have until today, in like nine thousand six hundred casualties who were dead from COVID, uh, which is a very low number in, in comparison to other European and uh, industrialized countries. Um, so that also means that our health system in general was well prepared. Uh, Germany has a very comprehensive um, health system, 
uh, people do have overwhelmingly a, a health insurance, so are covered. Uh, so that also, I think, made a big difference why Germany fared uh, quite well in, in this phase. But uh, the political challenges were, however, quite uh, unique and new. Um, one had to maintain a critical infrastructure uh, of everything, of business, of education, of security, and of the health sector, obviously. And um, the, as I said, the, the border closures and the coordination between federal and, and state level, uh, uh, and that led also obviously to the coordination at the EU level uh, was uh, quite challenging. Uh, because the different countries also had different situations and different attitudes uh, towards this. Um, but then uh, also you had the, the tourism and travel crisis, which uh, ad was added to this. Uh, and actually Germany, the foreign office, uh, repatriated about 250,000 uh, German travelers, Germans being world champions in traveling, uh, so they had to be brought home from far-fetched uh, 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 islands like the Fijis or, and also from here, I myself uh, was, I, I participated in the repatriation of um, cruise ship passengers in particular, uh, who were stranded uh, here in our part of the world. Um, and um, well then, the, the challenge was also uh, to to, add, to, to prepare the conditions to find a vaccine and, and a treatment. And Germany was one of the instigators to, uh, to launch um, a sort of a fundraising, uh, international fundraising process, which raised about eight, mil eight billion uh, dollars, uh, the equivalent, um, which, which is destined to find a vaccine which would be distributed and available to many countries in the world. Unfortunately, at that time, the U.S. did not participate in this fundraising process. Uh, the, um, uh, of course, even more important in, in volume was the cooperation in the EU. And there, Germany and France made a big uh, proposal uh, for a future-oriented, sustainable uh, financial package, which amounted to 750 billion uh, euro and composed being composed of grants and loans um, to uh, to help recover from the from the pandemic and also to to help uh, the economy to, uh, to get back on track um, <clears throat> the economy is obviously one of the the key uh, challenges also for the politicians to judge uh, what is the health uh, priority? What is the economic uh, priority? One of the issues is the shutdown or lockdown that has been practiced in, in a number of countries. And also the supply chain system, which, uh, which is interrupted uh, because many uh, internationally oriented countries are importing and exporting uh, goods. Um, and so international trade has been heavily affected on this. Um, so in Germany, the accent was put on keeping the workforce on their job. And so that uh, we have a special mechanism in Germany, which existed before, but was sort of reintroduced speci especially for this. It's called Kurzarbeit, it's, uh, some kind of furlough, uh, which actually is uh, subsidizing wages for people who are de facto unemployed or are temporary, uh, temporarily unemployed. And the government would subsidize the different companies about 70% of the wage equivalent so that the companies, also the small and medium sized companies were able to maintain their staff and not to, to, uh, to have layoffs. Uh, that is one factor which distinguished Germany from many other countries. Uh, that helped also to avoid uh, a big, big rise in unemployment. Um, although in some sectors, like in airline, in the airlines uh, industry and in the car industry, we had some uh, layoffs. But I just read that in September uh, 2020, so just a month ago, 
we had an 8.4 uh, uh, rise of automobile sales in comparison to September 2019. Uh, so that's quite spectacular when you when you see this uh, situation. And uh, this this furlough system now, as it is visible that this uh, pandemic will be with us for a, long, a longer period, has now been extended to a maximum of 24 months, so that companies can still uh, rely on that on that uh, system. Now let me just comment a few, uh, make a few comments on the transatlantic uh, effects. Uh, obviously, there have been different approaches in the United States and in Germany uh, on this. There were so some similarities in the beginning as well. Uh, but as we had early testing and tracing in Germany, we did not have that at that extent to that extent here in the United States. Uh, we did have possibly at the. Well, the Almost at the same time, we had some lockdown or, or um, um, similar measures which, which are being, uh, being practiced. Um, we had, however, in Germany, relatively early, a very coherent message concerning masks, uh, that you needed to wear a mask and uh, that, that was uh, helping to avoid the spread. As you know, the communication about masks in the United States uh, was quite inconsistent and is even has been politicized quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, the opening of the economy uh, in Germany was uh, done in a quite in a staggered way, uh, so not everywhere at the, uh, in the same uh, rhythm. Um, here, if I look at Florida, it, <coughs> um, it was also sort of in a phase-by-phase -phase, uh, reopening, but uh, just recently we had sort of a complete reopening, which came as a surprise for the for economic actors. Uh, and um, so I think that also uh, has been avoided in Germany to prepare these decision a little bit more in advance. Um, the uh, international uh, cooperation on this is also a priority of Germany. Germany is in general very much in favor because of its economic uh, relationships, its uh, export capacities. We are very much interested in international cooperation, uh, very much involved in the United Nations and other um, agencies. So we support the WHO, the World Health Organization, even though uh, justifiably a number of criticism has been uh, has been uh, addressed to the WHO, but we do think that this has to be addressed at uh, sort of inside the, the WHO as also a uh, critical um, a critical dialogue with China has to be engaged, which, which certainly could have done things uh, in a much more transparent way uh, than it has been done in, in reality. So to sum it up, I think what we all need is uh, to, uh, to have a sustainable methodology um, to, to, uh, to enable a full recovery. Uh, and that can only take place if we take into account what our neighbors do, uh, at least in Europe. That's, uh, that's particularly so for Germany. Uh, it is no worth uh, having a healthy German economy if all the neighbors like France and Italy are still suffering uh, because that also impacts immediately on German economy and trade and exports. So uh, I think the recipe, if there is any, uh, without having a vaccine yet and, and treatment, is to, uh, to have a, a long-term sustainable recovery program like the one uh, decided within the EU uh, to have a good and coherent communication which insists on making the population resilient and capable and respectful of, uh, of the others uh, to uh, not spread the virus anymore and therefore have also a feeling of solidarity that, that everyone is concerned and uh, does uh, his or her share on this. So. Um, these are about uh, the, the comments that I'd want to make, and maybe there is some, some more I can say afterwards uh, in the question period. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Consul General Siegel, for those insightful remarks. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Zinzi Bailey. Dr. Bailey is a social epidemiologist who's focused on cancer health disparities, as well as the health impacts and policy solutions for structural and institutional discrimination, especially at the intersection of public health and criminal justice, which has really um, been very significant in the response to COVID-19. Dr. Bailey earned her Doctor of Science degree in social and behavioral sciences from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She also has a Master of Public Health degree with a concentration in global epidemiology from Emory University. And prior to working at the University of Miami, she worked for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, McGill's Institute for Health and Social Policy, and Harvard Kennedy School's Program in Criminal Justice Policy. So thank you for speaking to us today, Dr. Bailey. Hello, my name is Zinzi Bailey, and I'm a research assistant professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. I'm here to talk to you today about um, the United States' um, abysmal response to the COVID pandemic and what we can learn from other countries, namely Germany. If we go back to the very beginning, when we started to hear about a pneumonia of unknown origin um, from Wuhan, uh, we should have been aware and uh, alerted and, and activated to plan for what our potential response could be. It uh, doesn't mean that it has to come here, but we should have been alerted and prepared to move to the next level. However, instead we saw uh, and heard a lot of rhetoric around a Chinese virus, um, some interventions around uh, immigration uh, from China, but not from other countries. Um, and we saw a lot of uh, mentions or, or references to uh, COVID-19 being a hoax, right? Um, but besides these kind of uh, key activities around the incompetence and uh, leadership vacuums of the current administration, we can also highlight the deep structural inequities and the racialized dismantling of our social safety net that have made the um, precise policy recipe for structural vulnerability within the United States to this pandemic and to others. So if we go to Public Health 101, if we were trying to reduce the spread of an infectious disease, we would first go to containment. Containment would mean that we would need to develop a case definition, an accurate test, um, and be able to um, screen a large swath of individuals who might be at risk and identify and isolate cases such that they are not in interaction with other people who might be at risk. We would ask them about who they were in contact with um, during the, the period of time that they might have been infectious. We would then contact those people, test them, um, isolate the cases, and go on and, and um, continue doing that until we had effectively contained the disease, right? We would kind of separate it out and it was would be kind of um, isolated, right? Um, but that requires a number of things. It requires robust testing, often free testing so that there are no restrictions and barriers to access. Um, we would need public health staff to be able to do that contact tracing. We would also need facilities to be able to isolate people who might not have um, the housing conditions to uh, facilitate self-isolation, right? However, um, our administration failed, failed to do any of this by any stretch of the imagination, by any indicator of success, we have failed miserably um, to contain this pandemic. Um, essentially, we fail to create a coordinated response to how we would screen, uh, test, isolate. There were constantly changing recommendations that were not consistent with the science. Um, there were a lot of uh, disagreements on different political levels as to how we would proceed. And there was no coordination from the top. So in the absence of... Uh, this kind of swift containment, which you need to do within a certain time window, while there are few cases, so you're able to mount the appropriate capacity to meet the need. We move to 
mitigation. So it's not containing, but it's mitigating the impact of the spread of disease. That will include key personal preventive measures, including wearing masks, um, being able to wash hands uh, effectively, being able to uh, monitor your distancing from other people, and physically distancing, um, as in uh, sheltering in place. So um, again, as we approached mitigation, we did not have a coordinated way to do that. We had no national standards of what we should do in the case of um, this mitigation, right? There were some states who were locking down, other states who were not, other, some states shelter in place, other places not. Some places had a mask mandate, some did not. It was all over the place and it had nothing to do with need. It had to do with political decision-making and resources. So um, through that whole process, if we had been trying to meet need, then we could say that we were actually um, creating a heterogeneous response um, from a scientific standpoint, assessing the need and responding accordingly. However, that's not what we found, right? So the scientific uh, community has been routinely sidelined throughout this pandemic. Um, there's tons of great work coming out, but it doesn't necessarily make it into the actual execution and the policy making um, on the federal, um, state, and local levels. And what we have learned is that uh, COVID-19 has laid bare some deep structural inequities that have been there for a long time and have created the conditions in which we live. And across different groups, these are very disparate outcomes. So um, oftentimes people have said, while COVID-19 is uh, indiscriminate in its transmission, its propagation within a society so deeply steeped in structural racism like the United States, you know, it's inevitably going to have disproportionate impacts on marginalized uh, racial and ethnic groups, um, other social groups, right? Um, so that's what we have come to see. We have disproportionate burden, incidence, and mortality associated with COVID in Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color. Um, but this is all heightened by the uncoordinated response. It's heightened by the, you know, the uh, test rationing. It's heightened by the discordant and contradictory recommendations. All of that heightens inequities that have been existing in, within our country for a very long time. Um, you could say that there, those impacts are primarily on those marginalized groups, right? So the reliance on hospital-based, mostly drive-through testing um, has advantaged uh, white, wealthier res residents uh, compared to communities of color. Um, essentially, um, those who are able to have a car at their disposal and the time to stand in line or to stay in line for hours, we're able to access that kind of testing, especially at the beginning. Um, those who were in wealthier neighborhoods um, were able to buy their way through testing. For instance, here in South Florida, Fisher Island was able to acquire a number of tests for every individual um, living on Fisher Island. That's not something that was available for those in the West Grove. We have to think about what people had access to. Um, essential workers, we have the essential workers who are the doctors and the nurses and the firefighters and the police. We have those individuals that we see very often, but there are a number of essential workers who are less visible. They're the people who are working at nursing homes, the people who are uh, serving food. There are uh, the garbage collectors, there are a number of different people. And what we have found is that essential workers who are in the most contact with people in their day-to-day -day work are also um, the least visible and they're the low income uh, workers of color, right? Our racial capitalism that's inherent in our current systems as we've developed them, um, have sorted people into certain jobs and certain positions, which put them at higher risk for disease. And they're also at, um, they have lower levels of power in terms of negotiation. 
if the nursing home attendant uh, negotiates for his or her their um, pay, their PPE, their access, um, they can essentially get rid of that person and find somebody else, right? They're getting paid peanuts. And so often people are working from, you know, nursing home to nursing home to nursing home, where that also facilitates spread. And um, if we think about the structural barriers to healthcare access, we know that, um, for example, Black Americans are um, most likely to be found in states that have no access, no uh, Medicaid um, expansion, which reduces healthcare access just on the whole. People are less likely to approach hospital-based testing or seeking care if they think that they're going to um, put their family into debt for generations. These are all realities within our current system. And we also can couple that with cuts in our public health infrastructure, as well as just the overall unraveling of the national safety net. Starting in the 1980s, somewhat before, but really in the 1980s, under the Reagan administration, there was a systematic dismantling of the Great Society programs that benefited white families in this country for generations, such that they can build intergenerational wealth. Those, once we expanded the we of the nation to include black, um, indigenous, uh, Latinx um, communities, we started thinking about who we really wanted to share sh pooled resources with, right? Who de was deserving? Who was mooching off the system? Who was um, inherently pathological, right? So there were a lot of arguments, racialized arguments, of people who did not deserve to have access to welfare, ac access to food assistance, access to health care, right? Um, that they were not, um, uh, they didn't have rights to do that. So there was a kind of rhetoric around, an argument around dismantling the entire social safety net. And so um, as we see the life expectancies move forward, if we see, if we track um, wealthy nations, we can see that United, the United States from the 1980s um, starts to pull away from the life expectancy trends of other wealthy nations. Um, and a lot of that can be tied to uh, changes in our social safety net, right? Um, this had initial impacts on people of color, um, but we kind of normalized that under a system of structural racism. It was natural for certain communities to have less, um, less healthy uh, spaces, less uh, health for their children. That was natural. However, in 2015, the decisions that we made that initially burdened people of color then started to have impact on people, of white people, white communities, right? Such that we started to see a decline in the life expectancy amongst white people. So essentially the decisions that we've made that are racialized, racist, um, have also impacted us in such a way that it's detrimental to us all, right? To us as a society, it makes us more vulnerable to this and other pandemics. What can we learn from Germany with that said, right? We have a number of things to learn from Germany, including thinking about how we can develop equitable systems where we have universal health care. We're able to provide the same resources for everyone involved, that you're not just buying your access to health. Um, how can we have a coordinated response such that we're um, essentially taking recommendations into account and being able to work in concert towards a common end? How can we build up our social safety net such that everyone can have the ability to fall back on it um, if they need to at some point in their life? That we're not creating castes of people and tiers of service um, that become reified. And lastly, how do we put our trust in science such that we can make decisions, policy, based on those scientific results? How do we um, make sure that we're talking to epidemiologists when we're structuring our um, plan of attack for the pandemic? Those are key questions and key approaches that we would need to do in order to be effective at combating COVID-19. 
So with that said, um, I look forward to hearing from everybody um, and I hope this will be a rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bailey, for those very interesting remarks. I'm now very happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marcus Thiel, who's an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Florida International University. He also directs FIU Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. He graduated from UM um, with a PhD in International Studies in 2005, and he has published several EU-related articles and book chapters co-edited five different volumes and published the monographs The Limits of Transnationalism and EU Civil Society and Human Rights Advocacy. Welcome, Dr. Thiel. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Louise, Professor Louise Davidson and the Deutsche Jahr campaign uh, for hosting us on this important topic. Um, in my the next few minutes, I plan to talk about three different areas of concern or expertise. Um, the first one is sort of the question of how European states responded differently to the pandemic, economically, but also in terms of health policy. Um, the second part will be zooming in on the European Union's reaction um, to the pandemic. And the third is kind of an outlook on the uh, future of the European Union, uh, transatlantic relations and multilateralism under the influence of the pandemic. So the first thing I just want to quickly point out is that when I did some research for today's presentation is that I uh, found some sort of equivalency in the data. And obviously there's a lot of data going around in with regards to uh, COVID-19. But it seems that Germany, a country with 80 million people, for the past couple of weeks consistently had as many cases as the state of Florida has, um, about you know, 2,500 a day. So that's quite um, remarkable uh, for Germany. Um, comparatively speaking, also, if you look at um, larger political uh, or research institutions that measure the responses to COVID-19, um, there is the Global Health COVID-19 Response Index that measured the reaction or the policy reaction of about 40 governments worldwide. Um, and they have an index that ranges from one being having the worst response as a country to 100 having the best response. Um, and if you look at that, you have, get some sort of objective indication of how each country has fared in the response to COVID-19. Um, China actually was listed highest there with 80 points. Um, I don't have time to get into why that may be the case. Um, Germany has the highest ranking among the EU member states with 61 points out of 100, um, followed by Italy with 57 points, um, then the US with 50 points, which virtually ties with France, Russia and the United Kingdom. Um, also domestically, um, you want to, probably it's interesting to know that a very high percentage of German citizens stand behind the German government's COVID response. One of the numbers that I got was 88% of German citizens subscribed to um, her handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. But overall, across European states, there was a divergence of national responses, as you can imagine. Um, there were, on the one hand, you know, a fairly famous or maybe infamous Swedish response that was relatively lax and loose and didn't have lots of the social restrictions. Um, so those were hotly debated within the European Union, but also internationally. But then there were, of course, the more restrictive approaches, in particular uh, by the most heavily affected countries and the early affected countries of Italy and Spain. Um, but let's go back a little bit um, to sort of the timeline, what happened. Um, after the initial panic, um, it was important for the countries to m minimize border controls because, it w as it was for, uh, before mentioned by the German Consul General, um, that there would have been a problem with the supply chains in the European Union and for European the economies, for European uh, markets, and so on and so on. So there was really a sort of a trying to figure out how to um, introduce border, border controls that were not too restrictive on the mobility of goods and trade more generally. Then it was uh, became, um, as the pandemic progressed, it became more important to exchange medical equipment and knowledge about the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, as a result of that, it became also important to mutually form each other 
um, within the European Union about potential travel restrictions, um, especially because within the EU there's a relatively high degree of mobility and of tourism as well, which of course um, this summer looked very different in those terms. But fundamentally, um, you can say that amongst European Union member states, the 27 of them, um, the relatively well-developed national health care policies, um, or what sometimes deridingly in the US is called um, socialized medicine, um, they provided much better coverage uh, for individuals. That of course also meant um, better testing, earlier testing, and better treatment actions compared to the United States. But however, if you look um, amongst the European Union member states, you also found that, that those were better, those national healthcare policies are better developed with more capacity in, the, in Western Europe, uh, Western Central Europe, than in Southern Europe or in Eastern Europe. In addition, um, the question of public messaging that was mentioned before was also very important. In Germany, Chancellor Merkel, um, she herself is a scientist. And as such, she had a, a very a different standing um, amongst the population. And she had a clear messaging about the potential threat that COVID-19 may uh, pose, um, as opposed to some of these uh, back and forth um, that occurred here in the United States. Um, However, just like we saw the initial reactions to COVID-19 in terms of restrictions, you also saw that the messaging was nationally adapted. So in Sweden, you had a more low-key adaptive approach that was in line with Swedish um, social and societal cohesion. Italy had a much more drastic approach that, of course, reflected the heavy early impact of the pandemic there. And the Central and Eastern European countries sh have shut down the borders very early on and um, also imposed lockdowns there. But in general, as has been mentioned before, there was hardly any politicization of the prioritization of communal health and what it meant for each individual, you know, just to kind of contribute to the common good of um, trying to minimize the effects of the pandemic. That has also been, uh, has been reflected in higher institutional trust across European Union member states. So we have find Many fewer people, for example, that are anti-vaxxers or vaccine, potential vaccine refusers should the vaccine come on the market than in the US or elsewhere. But we have now, as um, Consul, Siegel, Consul General Siegel mentioned, a second wave arriving. And with, that means with the arrival of colder weather, there will be more indoor activities, which will, of course, increase the susceptibility. Plus, um, there is a general susceptibility for infectious diseases, colds, flus, and so on and so on. That's already underway. And um, because of the relative early success of European pandemic, the pan European pandemic response, there was maybe a little bit of a too early opening, in fact. So in a way, European states may now find out that the, with the second or third wave that was mentioned, we may have too much of a success. So there has been some la increased laxity and that may cause more infections in the future. Um, this is of course especially difficult or uh, more drastically pronounced in heavily urbanized areas, in cities or in refugee camps, which were, we also had some outbreaks there. So the rising numbers in case numbers that we just saw in you know, the past uh, two, three weeks in France, Spain and Belgium in particular have sparked fears that um, the European recovery may be short lived. But there are three reasons why that may not quite be as bad. First, if you, of course, as was already earlier mentioned, if you look at the aggregate numbers, you see that um, the US has consistently had pretty much double the number of COVID deaths um, as, in, as part of millions. So the US had 600 COVID deaths. Uh, through the last couple of months, as opposed to Europe's 300 COVID deaths per million. Um, and EU-wide daily new infection cases re are, remain consistently lower. Second, the increase in Europe is concentrated in a few countries. Again, the case in Spain is very serious. Um, new cases exceeded the, even the spring peaks and right now are even higher than um, in the US. And in Belgium and France, new cases are rising again with resulting new restrictions. For the rest, however, of Europe, the pandemic still seems as of now under control. And so cases have not risen that dramatically, despite increased testing and the fact that vacationers returned uh, home at the end of the summer, potentially importing new 
uh, cases. France's test positivity rate, for example, is still below the 5% threshold set by the WHO, the World Health Organization, for the pandemic uh, being under control. Thirdly, um, and most important for the recovery, Europe's social systems, and as well as the European Union Recovery Fund that I will talk about in a second, will constrain the economic, political, and social impact for individuals as well as societies. Um, and the worst hit countries in Europe, they are rather located on the geographic or economic periphery. If you think of Spain, Italy, um, the United Kingdom, which is now also uh, part of the EU's periphery as a non-member. By contrast, the pandemic in the US hit some of the economic powerhouses, as we all know, California, Florida, Texas, and so on. So that's about the different response of the European states. Now, how has the European Union specifically responded to the pandemic? In short, it appears that um, Europe, under the, the guidance of the European Commission, the EU's executive, has responded, I would say, better than the US, despite the fact that health is in fact a national policy and not an European Union legal man competence. After an initial moment of hesitation early on in the pandemic spring, when everybody was shocked and didn't know exactly what to expect, and um, the European Union institutions convinced the 27 member states not to shut, totally shut down the borders, to avoid an economic and supply crash. Um, European countries also took decisive actions at the end of March by creating a joint EU medical stockpile. And as it was already earlier mentioned, um, the European Union helped fly back over half a million EU citizens stuck across the world. In April, the European Union institutions published a roadmap with further recommendations for member states and provided smaller, very smaller aid packages to the most heavily affected countries. And then from May to July, EU leaders together or under the guidance of the European Union Commission negotiated a major COVID rescue package. And in August, it became one of the main supporters of the global vac uh, COVAX vaccine development fund by the United Nations World Health Organization, which I'll say about in a little bit. The biggest achievement, therefore, was certainly that the EU decided to, as it was mentioned earlier, to take on nearly um, 900 billion US dollars or 750 uh, billion euros in debt to assist its hardest hit members. And with the European consumption um, creeping back up, the recovery is, seems to be slowly getting underway, as we've heard earlier. In July, for example, EU retail trade volumes were even marginally up from last year. Um, so at the, the EU will have at its disposal a recovery to worth, a recovery to worth of 750 billion euros. That's called next generation EU, and that will partially consist of non-repayable grants to the hardest hit countries, and then also on loans for countries that think they want to um, have more of a credit line uh, to really stabilize their economic and uh, societal recovery. It's not only the largest collective aid fund in EU history, but it's also historic because for the first time the European Commission, backed by the 27 member states, will use its strong own credit rating to raise the money on the international financial markets. And even uh, economists who have started to analyze the way this has been done uh, positively evaluated the uh, dynamics or mechanisms of the next generation EU rescue fund. But to avoid to send a higher bill um, to the member states in the future, Europe is now looking at new resources or new taxation. These will, for example, include a levy on big tech companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook and the like, um, a tax on non-recycled plastics, as well as putting a carbon price on imports coming from countries that have lower climate ambitions. And this may likely negatively impact transatlantic relations. In addition, the European Union um, created the so-called SURE assistance program to finance so-called flexicurity work programs that um, allow workers, even with shorter working hours, to remain employed rather than become unemployed and therefore have to draw on unemployment assistance. Um, the EU Council approved 88 billion euros, so about 
roughly 100 billion US dollars to support 16 of the most heavily impacted EU states in that, with that program. Um, whereas if we compare that to the US, some of the US aid, recovery aid was either ill-designed um, or badly implemented. And in generally, um, it, of course, any future recovery policy will be negatively impacted by the ongoing election campaign and the pressures thereof. So third, my third point, what challenges and opportunities um, will there be for the EU's future and for transatlantic relations in the months or years to come? Well, with regards to the EU future, um, having the, the, to disperse such a large fund, um, close to one trillion US dollars, um, coupled with also the EU's new multi-annual budget from 2021 to 2027, will mean that the European Union institutions will have much more closely, um, they have to watch and monitor more closely how the money is spent, um, not only to avoid corruption, but also waste. Um, but also to make sure that European Union economies are not further drifting apart in terms of their economic competitiveness, because there is some residual issue with that, and the Euro crisis made that clear. But related to that, um, European Union institutions also have moved towards uh, monitoring the civil liberties, um, particularly as regards to privacy issues. If you think of the, for example, the, how should the contract, contact, sorry, the contact tracing of individuals occur? as well as um, questions of democratic pluralism, because some member states um, are alleged to have used the pandemic to limit um, the democratic rules of the game. For example, um, Poland went ahead and um, pressed with their elections during the pandemic, or Hungary implemented an emergency law without any end dates. So we have to be carefully make sure that there is no, the, the crisis is not being used um, for the expansion of any semi-authoritarian tendencies. In addition, of course, you have various misinformation campaigns by Russia, China, Iran, as well as EU-based domestic fringe parties on social media. Now, with regards to the transatlantic relations, um, despite for the official calls for more unity in the face of the pandemic, as well as other transnational issues such as climate change, cybersecurity, etc., I believe it will be difficult to go back to transatlantic relations as they were in the 20th century. First, um, because the EU as an international organization itself is affected by the United States' lack of acceptance of a multilateral order being a multilateral organization itself. Moreover, Europeans now have become frustrated by the starkly contrasting dynamics of each changing administration. Um, think of you know, George W. Bush's more unilateral policies as well as transatlantic policies. Then you had the Obama administration, which was of course generally more well received, but also um, implemented the so-called pivot to Asia and away from Europe. And now you have um, D Donald Trump's unilateral policies, um, the withdrawal from U United Nations bodies, and of course the withdrawal from the highly cherished Iran, in the European Union, highly cherished Iran nuclear treaty. And as such, not only has the US distanced itself from the European Union, but also dominant countries in the European Union, such as France and Germany, they aim to widen the transatlantic rift and become more self-sufficient. And with the United Kingdom leaving the EU, the most transatlantically minded country has actually left the bloc. The US presidential election on November 3rd could be a game changer, but even if Joe Biden should win, uh, which would allow for restoration of the transatlantic bargain to some extent, the arrival of a new administration would not alter the long-term shift in US priorities away from Europe, nor would it loosen the American public's attachment to national sovereignty. Um, this also becomes, by the way, um, apparent in threat perceptions in which the United States has uh, frames threats more consistently around specific nations, be it Cuba, North Korea, Iran, whereas the Europeans have a less singularly focused threat perceptions. And uh, for them, it's more about, you know, for example, global inequality, um, environmental degradation, the pandemic. And after COVID, unfortunately, also the US is counted now as a potential threat. So the assertion that the common defense needs bind um, both Europe and the United States together appears increasingly out of date. And the same can be said about the notion of common values because we have problems with democracy and human rights and the rule of law on both sides at this point. 
Um, so the, the necessity of mutual interests in terms of trade and finance may be the most stable linkage at this point. But this is a rather basic transactional commonality that's already under pressure, for example, by diverging positions on the role of China's rise. Lastly, and very quickly, with regards to multilateralism, I also want to point out that the European Union, of course, has supported the United Nations World Health Organization's call for action and has raised almost by now 16 billion uh, euros under the Coronavirus Global Response COVAX program. And that is a program, the COVAX program by the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, which aims at universal access to tests treatments and vaccines against coronavirus and for the global recovery um, while uh, the United States never participated. Um, with that being said, I conclude my presentation and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thiel, for those very interesting remarks. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. David J. Kramer. David Kramer is Senior Fellow in the Vaclav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy at Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. He also directs FIU's program in European and Eurasian Studies. He holds degrees from Harvard University and Tufts. Before coming to FIU, he worked in Washington, D.C. for 24 years with a number of different institutions, including the McCain Institute for International Leadership, the Freedom House, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, and various other think tanks. Hello, my name is David Kramer, and I'm a senior fellow in the Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy, and also director of the European and Eurasian Studies Program, both at the Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. I'm pleased to join you today, and I have been asked to talk about how the pandemic has impacted human rights and democracy in Germany, the EU, or the US. And uh, I'm gonna start with a bit of a broad picture and then look at the situation in Germany, the EU, and the US. And I, I say this because uh, Freedom House, an organization I used to work for, came out with a report very recently in which it said, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has fueled a crisis for democracy around the world. Since the coronavirus outbreak began, the condition of democracy and human rights has grown worse in 80 countries. Governments have responded by engaging in abuses of power, silencing their critics, and weakening or shuttering important institutions, often undermining the very systems of accountability needed to protect public health. The COVID-19 pandemic, the report goes on to say, is exacerbating the 14 years of consecutive decline in freedom. Not only is democracy weakened in 80 countries, but the problem is particularly acute in struggling democracies in highly repressive states. Now, there, there is no question that the pandemic has had an impact on democracy and human rights. If you look at the very fundamental freedom of assembly, that has been significantly affected during the pandemic as governments have ordered that people should not gather in large groups because of the fear of uh, contagion. And we also see some governments using the pandemic as an opportunity to crack down on freedom of speech as well, where they use this as a, as a, a possibility to go after government critics, journalists, uh, opposition figures and others under the pretext that they are spreading disinformation when in reality, they simply want them to, to be quiet. They don't want them to criticize what they're doing in response to the pandemic. We've seen varying responses from governments uh, around the world, including in on the European continent and here in the United States, where I think many people believe that a number of governments have not responded well, others have. And if you look at the uh, death rates and the percentage of deaths compared to percentage of populations, the United States doesn't fare very well in this pandemic. And so protecting the very uh, fundamental right to life has been an issue that has been adversely affected during this pandemic. Um, in, in Germany, I think Chancellor Merkel has made a point of stressing the importance of transparency and preserving democratic principles and human rights during this crisis. Um, she has done her best, I think, to ensure that the necessary attention is provided and resources devoted to dealing with this crisis. 
And for the most part, I think the response among Germans has been very positive. They view uh, Chancellor Merkel and her government as handling the pandemic quite well, while not sacrificing to a significant extent uh, human rights or democracy and freedom. And some 88%, according to a recent poll, support what Chancellor Merkel is doing, trying to balance these issues of uh, dealing with the public health crisis, but also trying to preserve the basic elements of freedom and democracy. Elsewhere in Europe, um, just very recently, the European Union released a report on rule of law on the continent, dealing with all 27 EU member states. And it is very critical of, of a number of countries, in particular of, of Hungary and Poland, uh, where it raises concerns about uh, the degree to which the judiciary is being pressured, the degree to which um, the use of resources on public television are being diverted to support the ruling party. Now, these problems existed before, but in the case of Hungary, um, we saw the Hungarian parliament, for example, grant emergency powers to Viktor Orban to deal with the pandemic. Now, Orban claims to have returned and, and said he no longer needs those powers anymore. But we have seen a number of, of parliaments, including in Europe, grant the executive more powers and authority to deal with the pandemic. But then that runs the risk that these, author that these powers will be exploited by the executive branch in, in ways that would not be good for democracy or human rights. On the European continent, uh, we also have seen uh, the protests in Belarus. And, and here, uh, this the pandemic does have quite a bit to do with this. Uh, the leader, the authoritarian leader who's been in power for 26 years, Alexander Lukashenko, basically dismissed the pandemic, said it was nothing, uh, drink some vodka, go to a sauna, go for a ride on a tractor. Those are the ways to deal with a pandemic. And, and Belarusians, I think, were so outraged by Lukashenko's failed handling of the crisis that they felt uh, it was time for a change. They've had enough of his rule for the past two and a half decades. And so after the August 9th election, uh, in which Lukashenko claimed victory despite uh, significant evidence showing that, in fact, the uh, challenges Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya won. Um, uh, Lukashenko declared victory, and as a result, Belarusians have been protesting in the streets ever since. Um, massive numbers, particularly compared to what we've seen in the past when there were controversial elections in Belarus before. The, the, the issue here is that the pandemic had a lot to do with Belarusians' dissatisfaction with Lukashenko's rule. Um, they're also fed up with his authoritarian nature in general. And we have also seen, I think, a lack of support from the rest of Europe and from the United States on behalf of the people of Belarus who have bravely gone out in the streets uh, protesting for a better, brighter future. Um, the EU and the United States took uh, about two months almost to impose sanctions on officials in the Lukashenko regime uh, in response not only to the election, but then to the brutal force that was used against peaceful protesters. And, and having taken two months was not a good way for either the 27 members of the European Union or for the UK or Canada or the United States to really show its steadfast solidarity with the people of Belarus. Um, so we have seen a, a, a pretty mixed record. People wanting to live in, in greater freedom, demanding respect for human rights, uh, disband, de demanding a, a, a restoration of democracy in places like Belarus. We've also seen this in Kyrgyzstan, which I realize gets a little beyond the European continent, but um, a revolutionary movement possibly unfolding in Kyrgyzstan after fraudulent parliamentary elections. The spirit to live in a free society lives on, even in this pandemic, even in this very difficult time. Um, and, and we also have seen this here in the United States, where uh, the United States has arguably uh, suffered the greatest losses. We constitute 4% of the world's population, and yet we're a little more than 20% of the total fatalities as a result of the pandemic. Uh, there have been crackdowns on assembly, although there have been a number of governors and local officials who have eased up on that. Um, there has been a ridiculous debate, in my view, about wearing of masks, that this is 
uh, an infringement on one's freedom and liberty. Um, it, instead, everyone should recognize that wearing a mask does a service for everyone, including the mask wearer, and reducing the spread of the of the virus. Um, and we've seen some pretty uh, outrageous attacks against the media um, and others for trying to disseminate truthful information. And instead, we see a lot of disinformation being spread here in the United States. It's true in Europe as well. Uh, but at a time of a public health crisis in the middle of a pandemic, our leaders uh, in Europe and the United States need to do a better job of ensuring that the public gets proper information. It knows the truth. There's no cover up. There's no concealing. And there should be leading by example. And as I started, I think we have seen that in the case of, of Germany with Chancellor Merkel. I think we've seen it in other countries in Europe as well. We haven't seen such a good performance in some countries in Europe too. But here in the United States, it's hard to argue with some now 211,000 people dead as a result of this uh, COVID crisis, the pandemic, that we have done a very good job here in the United States. And, and we have an election coming up. So this is uh, an incredibly important issue when it comes to exercising arguably the most fundamental freedom and right we have, which is to freely choose our own leaders in a free and fair election, an election that will be decided by voters. Um, and this, to a large extent, will be a referendum on, on President Trump, whether he has done a good job uh, in voters' minds over the past four plus years. But certainly the pandemic has put into focus uh, the response of, of the United States government and of the Trump administration in its handling of this. So this has been a very difficult time. As Freedom House's report notes, it's been a difficult time in Europe. Some countries are emerging better from this than others. Uh, the United States, I think, has gone through an especially challenging time when it comes to uh, democracy and human rights and dealing with the pandemic. Um, but on November 3rd, Americans are going to go to the polls and vote. Now, uh, many Americans have already gone to vote in early voting opportunities. Um, so our, we are exercising our most fundamental freedom, which is to choose our leaders freely. And we have to make sure that other countries also maintain and preserve this most fundamental freedom while also preserving other freedoms as well, particularly freedom of speech and also address threats. The pandemic is, is arguably one of the biggest threats we're facing right now, but so is disinformation. So are efforts to try to sow discord and, and dissension within our societies. And yes, a lot of this comes from Russian disinformation, some of it from other places, but our polarized societies also pose a threat to our, our democracy. When we are so divided, when we are so polarized, when we are so distrustful of people in the other party or with different political views, when we are so disdainful, um, that poses a threat to our freedom, to our democracy. Uh, in a pandemic, arguably more than at any time, we need to unite, we need to come together, and we need to deal both with a public health crisis while simultaneously preserving what makes us who we are, free countries, democratic countries with respect for human rights. And that is the best way for us to deal with the COVID crisis or anything else that might come our way. Uh, so with that, thank you for the opportunity to join you. And uh, I look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kramer, for those remarks. And now I'd like to introduce our last speaker for the day, Dr. Brian Blankenship, who is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Miami and currently serving as the Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, DC. Dr. Blankenship holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University and a BA from Indiana University. He is the author of multiple articles that focus on alliance relationship, and his research and teaching focuses on international relations, um, especially international security and international cooperation. Thank you, Dr. Blankenship. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is, uh, is Brian Blankenship. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Miami. Uh, and I'm quite thrilled to be joining this roundtable, uh, albeit in, uh, in virtual form. 
Uh, I, uh, I am speaking to you, to you today here from, from Washington, D.C., actually, where I'm, uh, I'm on fellowship at the, the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, so today I, I wanted to talk a bit about the state of German-American relations, uh, the role of the pandemic, and what the future might hold for, uh, for, for German-American relations. Now, uh, it's, uh, it's hardly a, a novel claim to, uh, to say that German-American relations have been rocky under President Trump. Uh, Trump really came into office uh, as a candidate who had exhibited a huge amount of skepticism of, of U.S. alliances uh, more, more broadly, uh, but in particular uh, really showed uh, an animosity toward the NATO alliance. Um, and, and has uh, at various points shown a, uh, a really intense uh, dislike for, for Germany and for, for its chancellor, Angela Merkel. Um, and this has largely set the tone for German-American relations uh, during Trump's presidency. So um, early in his, uh, in his first, uh, first year as president, uh, Trump <clears throat> was at a, uh, a, a NATO summit in, in Brussels in, in May of 2017. And uh, during that summit, he delivered a speech in which he was supposed to uh, rhetorically reaffirm the U.S. commitment to NATO's Article 5, which holds that uh, an attack on any one NATO member is an attack on all of them. Um, now, this sort of reassurance tends to be quite, uh, you know, almost a matter of course in, uh, in, US, uh, in U.S. foreign policy. Presidents do it really quite routinely. Um, Trump, though, uh, removed a line, from, removed the line from his speech in which he would, in which he would uh, reaffirm that the U.S. would would protect its its NATO partners and honor Article Five. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, Chancellor Merkel um, gave a speech in which she uh, she argued that it was time for Europeans to take their fates into their own hands. Um, and indeed, just this year, um, uh, to name a more recent example. Uh, Trump withdrew some 12,000 uh, American forces uh, from Germany out of, out of, out of around 35,000, um, largely on the grounds, uh, it, it has at least been speculated, details are still uh, somewhat murky. Uh, but the, the picture that's been painted is that Trump, uh, this was essentially a retaliation for uh, what Trump perceived as insufficient uh, German defense burden sharing. Um, but it would be an exaggeration to see Trump as a unique disruptor of an otherwise stable status quo. Uh, some of the issues that Trump has really brought to fore in the uh, brought to the fore in the alliance have been issues that have been bubbling beneath the surface uh, for quite some time. Um, so, one of these is the issue of uh, of burden sharing and the U.S. Ro uh, role in NATO. Uh, more generally. Um, Barack Obama, for one, uh, withdrew about 7,000 uh, U.S. forces from Germany uh, during uh, his, his time as president, uh, though he, he later uh, returned some forces to Europe after Russia's annexation of, uh, of Crimea. Um, and Obama's Defense Secretary Robert Gates uh, made it clear on a number of occasions to, uh, to European leaders that uh, if, if the European members of NATO didn't do more for their own defense, uh, they could very well expect the American public to grow uh, quite frustrated and, and uh, perhaps unwilling to, uh, to continue supporting America's role as uh, the guarantor of, of, of security on the European continent uh, in the form of, of NATO. Um, now, another issue that, that Trump has, has really um, uh, really drawn attention to, but but which has no by no means been unique to Trump is the issue of, of what to do about Russia. Um, now, Trump himself is somewhat infamous uh, for his uh, you know what's what's often been considered a soft line toward uh, Russia's Vladimir Putin, but the the issue of, of how to treat Russia and what role it plays on the continent uh, have been around for 
you know, for, for decades. It, this is by no means a, uh, a new uh, feature to, to the Trump presidency. Uh, a number of German officials, uh, for example, have uh, historically uh, uh, questioned the, uh, the wisdom of, uh, of you know, uh, excessively building up NATO's military power in Eastern Europe, and particularly in, in the Baltic region, fearing that uh, this could provoke Russia. Um, and it, indeed, um, there, there's evidence to suggest that public opinion uh, among NATO countries is fairly skeptical of, uh, of the alliance, or at least of the, uh, the alliance's mutual defense pledge. There have been a lot of public opinion polls showing that, uh, that uh, the, the public in, in Germany, but, uh, but, but also in other NATO members as well, uh, generally uh, would not support uh, honoring NATO's Article 5 if another NATO member was attacked. Um, and again, this is by no means unique to Germany, but it suggests a, uh, a, a, a troubling um, lack of, um, a troubling skepticism of, of, the, uh, of the alliance in, uh, in uh, public opinion in NATO countries. Now, a third issue that Trump has brought to the fore is what to do about China. Um, China doesn't pose a security threat to Germany in the same way that it does to US allies in Asia. Um, and it doesn't pose the same sort of threat to Germany that, uh, that, that even Russia does. Um, and by contrast, uh, the United States has, uh, has increasingly uh, particularly under Trump, though the, though the trend somewhat predates him, began to see China as more of a competitor, more of a rival. And this has inevitably created some friction in the U.S.-German alliance, uh, where uh, the Germans have been relatively open to, um, to, to Chinese um, uh, economic activity in the continent. For example, there's been um, something of a, of a heated debate um, within NATO and within the European Union over what to do about the uh, Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei, um, which uh, the US would prefer not be allowed to operate its 5G network on the continent, but which Germany has been hesitant to, uh, to, to, to rule out. And this brings us to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, realistically, it's still early days yet. Uh, but what evidence we have suggests that the pandemic, um, and particularly you know, the, the American response to it, has worsened German-American relations and uh, may very well continue to do so. Uh, in terms of public opinion, uh, there's some polling evidence suggesting that, um, that the American response to COVID-19 has um, been uh, rather underwhelming in the eyes of, of many uh, foreign publics, uh, and that this has uh, in turn contributed to skepticism uh, of, of the United States and, and less confidence in the, in the United States as, uh, as a global leader and, and, as a, uh, and as a security guarantor. Um, now, in terms of uh, higher level diplomatic relations, um, there have been a, a couple of incidents in particular that have uh, ruffled feathers in um, in NATO capitals and uh, in, including in in Berlin. Um, for one, uh, one of you know one of these was Trump's uh, sudden uh, imposition of of the travel ban on uh, on European visitors early in the crisis, which was done really on on fairly short notice uh, without much in the way of consultation uh, with uh, with the other members. Um, or with uh, you know, with with members of NATO and with members of the EU, um, and there's also been some concern that the sort of increasing um, skepticism uh, about about foreign trade. Uh, you know, uh, Trump has really made opposition to foreign trade a a cornerstone of his foreign policy, um, and particularly. There's been some concern about um, 
what this might mean for the distribution of, uh, of a vaccine once, once that's developed. Um, uh, Trump, for example, uh, pulled the United States out of the, uh, out of the COVID-19 uh, Vaccines Global Access Facility, which um, is uh, essentially a, a global effort to um, help produce and, and distribute a vaccine, uh, which, uh, which, is, which is backed by, among others, Germany. Now, in terms of COVID-19's broader effects, um, it's still early days yet, um, but what, what, we, what we can speculate about is that the pandemic is really more, it's more likely to accelerate trends that are already happening and, and have already been underway than it is to really fundamentally reshape German-American relations. Um, for one, in an era where budgets are likely to be constrained, <clears throat> both in the short term as a result of, um, of the economic downturn caused by the pandemic, but in the longer term as a result of, uh, of, of America's growing, uh, growing uh, national debt, um, they, there, it's reasonable to question whether the United States <clears throat> will be willing to continue playing the role uh, that it has uh, historically as the as the guarantor uh, of security in, in in Europe. Now, what does this mean for the future of German American relations? Now, what I, what I've set up to now has painted something of a, a fairly bleak picture, um, but it, but it's important to I think put this in in perspective. So. Um, <clears throat> The you know, uncertainty about the future of the German-American alliance and uncertainty about NATO um, is by no means unique to the current era. You know, there have been a number of occasions in the past where the, uh, the alliance has seemed in doubt and where there's been a great deal of uncertainty about, uh, about the future of NATO and about the future of German-American relations. Um, for example, disputes over burden sharing and trade are by no means new. Uh, the 1960s and 1970s saw uh, huge amounts of animosity uh, over burden sharing in the NATO alliance, over um, what was perceived by the United States as um, as European protectionism, uh, and you know these were the subject of of a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of hard bargaining, uh, a lot of um, harsh words. Uh, if you look at a lot of the statements of presidents like. Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, uh, the language that they use is often, often in hindsight sounds positively Trumpian uh, in, in seeking to, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in, you know, in their efforts to, um, to use the threat of troop withdrawals and to use the, uh, the possibility of diminished American protection as a way to put pressure on the Europeans over issues of burden sharing and issues of trade. Now, of course, in each of these cases, uh, the alliance survived. Um, but importantly, it's, it's a partnership that has to be continually adapted over time and has to be tended to, right? So um, <clears throat> patient and, and careful diplomacy here is, is, is key to make sure that the alliance remains relevant and that, and that the partners um, are uh, able to overcome Disagreements on individual issues, um, in order to, uh, to, to to realize common interests. Now, of course, to some extent, the the future course of the alliance will depend, at least in part, on the outcome of the twenty twenty election. Uh, Joe Biden has, for example, really made uh, prioritizing U.S. alliances a core part of his foreign policy platform. Uh, which stands very much in contrast to Trump. Um, but even under a Biden presidency or, or, or whoever comes next, uh, the United States will inevitably shift some of its attention, potentially a lot of its attention uh, and resources uh, away from Europe and toward Asia, uh, both as a result of China's growing global power um, and as a result of, of Asia's centrality in, in the global economy. Um, in this way, Trump is uh, in, 
in many ways um, more of a symptom than, than a cause uh, of, of underlying trends. Um, nevertheless, um, to, to end on something of a, of a note of optimism, uh, Germany and America share a lot of common interests and common values that, that may very well carry the partnership forward, no matter their disagreements uh, on, on particular issues. Um, even if the alliance becomes less of a focal point uh, in their foreign policy, as seems relatively likely, um, they nevertheless share a common foundation as countries interested in resisting the spread of, of autocracy and anti-democratic forces. And as long as they share that foundation, uh, they, they very well may have a future as, as partners. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Blankenship, for those remarks. And now what I'd like to do is open up the floor to students from the University of Miami and Florida International University who have questions for our presenters today. Hi, my name is Natalie Rodriguez. I'm a junior at the University of Miami. And my question for Council Siegel is, what is one new economic or social policy that Germany has implemented as a result of the coronavirus pandemic? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that uh, question. I, I did uh, somehow uh, answer it in part already when I mentioned the uh, furlough or Kurzarbeit uh, system, which was especially um, sort of renewed and reintroduced uh, for this uh, to, to cope with this pandemic and extended to 24 months, uh, actually, so that companies have the time to recover and uh, can keep their staff. Um, the, uh, uh, another German policy which, which has been very strict in the past couple of years is a so-called black zero policy, uh, which means uh, the uh, national budget, annu the annual budget, is decided without making any further debt. Uh, now, for this particular case, the pandemic, the German government has recognized that this is a really a very exceptional situation and that this principle, which is actually enshrined even in the Constitution, uh, will be broken or can be suspended, at least for, uh, for the time being. Hi, my name is Bria and I am a junior here at FIU. My question is for Dr. Thiel and the question is, how is the European Union combating coronavirus? My name is Ian and my question is, uh, how is Germany and the EU planning to reopen with the second wave of COVID-19 hitting the countries of Europe? So thank you for your question about um, how Germany and the European Union member states in general plan to reopen with a second wave already on its way sweeping through Europe. Well, I would say, of course, it will be a huge challenge now, again, because I mentioned earlier already that uh, we may have had too much success early on and thereby a lessening of restrictions and that may come to bite us now. But we also gained a lot of experience um, in how to treat COVID, what COVID really is. There's also a better epidemiological uh, infrastructure in place. So countries are now able to react more quickly and more targeted and implement more localized, um, you know, partial lockdowns rather than total severe lockdowns. So, for, but I, for example, I agree that um, what happened just recently in Madrid, where certain areas of the town, the city of Madrid, were lo under lockdown, whereas neighboring areas weren't, that, in my opinion, doesn't make sense, because obviously we know about the mobility of individuals. Um, in France, and in, where we've seen a uh, rise recently, they went back to, for example, um, closing down bars and restaurants for the most, most part. Um, in Italy, um, Italy just imposed today a new um, mask rule, mask duty, for any kind of uh, public outing. So we can see here there's a much more quicker reaction, more targeted reaction. So I would hope that that mitigates some of the effects of the second wave. Uh, another important factor is, of course, schooling and higher education. And that is certainly a headache uh, everywhere across the board. Um, and this is a little bit of a problem because even as I think, if I'm correct, in Germany, we've seen that given the federal system there, that there are different rules with regards to, you know, the mask requirements in various states. So. So um, let's hope that this is not literally going to blow up the, um, the numbers of infections. 
Lastly, of course, one problem that I see is um, travel and tourism, which is very important for the European economies, as well as arts and the creative industries. And these two sectors will likely suffer the most and will be affected for the very long term. So we need um, specific uh, monetary and financial aid for those sectors. Um, and the European Union currently under the German presidency is right now trying to develop a common European Union sort of mobility map, um, which would then contain a unified approach to EU-wide travel restrictions. And I think that would really make sense um, because then if every all of the 27 member states really rely on one common source of information and have that information Europe-wide displayed, um, any future travel restrictions will be much more easily caught and could be therefore um, better handled than in the future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Daniela and I am a sophomore here at the University of Miami. My question is for Dr. Bailey or Consul Siegel. So it seems as if Germany has handled COVID better. In part, it seems as if Germans are more willing to follow and abide by stricter COVID restrictions than Americans. Why is this? Why do some people follow public health advice and other people don't? It's very astute of you to notice that different people are following public health uh, suggestions, recommendations at different rates. Uh, for example, um, there's a lot more adherence to mask mandates and things like that in places like Germany or, uh, for that matter, in Taiwan or Japan. Um, oftentimes, culture plays a huge role. Um, in particular, people who are coming from a culture that um, emphasizes and values the contribution to the group, contribution as a citizen, um, they're more likely to follow the rules that are set uh, forth um, for that group of people. Essentially, their contribution to the society is how they're behaving. In contrast, in the United States, there's a lot more emphasis on the individual and enhancing um, the liberties of the individual. So things get a little bit more complicated here. Um, there have been so many rallies around, you know, whether masks are oppressive and all sorts of things. But a lot of that is due to culture. Um, and maybe we need to figure out ways to promote more collectivist uh, sentiments in the United States. Hi, my name is Eitan Casverde and I'm a senior at Florida International University. Um, my question today is directed to David Kramer. And the question is, um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic undermined human rights and democracy movements around the world, especially in countries that don't have democratic governments but are moving towards them? Thank you. Hi, my name is Abel Ramos Taipe. I am a graduate student at FIU. My question is for David Kramer. This pandemic is a good starting point to increase cooperation on managing the pandemic. A dialogue should prevail in American and European efforts and improve NATO mechanisms to strengthen crisis management tools and resilience of Western societies. But how can the United States be reliable with our European partners if the American president cannot condemn actions against human rights done by Russia, like in the case of Alexei Navalny or the bounty against British and US soldiers? Thank you. So I've, I've been asked uh, two additional questions to address. Uh, one is, uh, what kind of position is the United States in to uh, try to improve the human rights situation around the world when we have our own problems and our own issues here? Um, and then another question is about how the pandemic has impacted movements fighting for human rights in non-democratic countries. And I, I talked earlier about the situation in Belarus with the people of Belarus uh, who have been living in, under an authoritarian leader for the past 26 years have courageously gone out and demanded they uh, better. They want change. They said enough is enough of Alexander Lukashenko. They want change. So in that situation, uh, people of Belarus uh, have, have been heroic in their efforts. Um, we have seen uh, people in other countries who want to preserve their right to vote 
Georgia will hold parliamentary elections at the end of October. Georgia is a is not a non-democratic country, but it has its challenges and problems. And we also see fighting breaking out between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which will also pose problems for protecting and preserving human rights in those two countries. In terms of the United States and the role it can play, yes, we have problems here in the United States. Uh, we, we have a lot of issues that we need to confront and deal with. Um, but the United States still has a critical role to play as a leader in democracy and human rights. And even with a pandemic, the United States cannot abandon its leadership role. We're not here to play the role of the world's policemen, but we are here uh, to provide a, a leadership role in helping those who want to live in freer societies be able to do so. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cutter and I'm a junior at the University of Miami. My question is for Dr. Blankenship and Dr. Thiel. How has the pandemic made the economic gap between EU countries wider? And how could this affect the integrity of the EU in the future? Thank you so much. One of the paradoxes of COVID-19 is that it's a crisis that's global in scope and would benefit from a global solution, uh, but it's also encouraged countries to turn inward, uh, encouraged a lot of border closing, uh, and just more generally encourage countries to really prioritize looking after their own citizens, and quite understandably so. Um, for example, early on in the pandemic, uh, Spain, Italy, and Serbia all reached out to China uh, for masks and ventilators uh, due to shortages that uh, the other EU members didn't have um, enough to spare for. Now, COVID-19 won't last forever, but potentially one of the longer reaching consequences of the pandemic uh, will be a shift away from free trade, not entirely, um, but at least towards greater domestic production, especially of key goods such as medicines and medical equipment. Uh, at the very least, we're likely to see countries try to diversify their sources of supply. Uh, this trend, of course, predates COVID-19 and isn't limited to the EU. Uh, one of the challenges that the EU faces is that its members don't have much flexibility in setting their own trade policy and making trade agreements with third party countries. Uh, member states effectively have to choose between EU membership and being able to make separate agreements uh, with third parties. And the choice may not always be obvious. Uh, China is, for example, an attractive source of, of trade investments and, uh, and loans. Uh, that being said, in, at least in my estimation, it's unlikely that coronavirus will lead to a breakup of the EU per se. Um, one advantage that EU members have is that uh, trade among them isn't subject to the same sorts of security concerns that, say, trade between the US and China is. Uh, keeping supply chains at the regional level is also quite attractive, as opposed to having them far flung at the global level. Um, the key then will be balancing a combination with member states' individual interests with the interests of the EU as a whole. Um, for example, a good example of this in, in play was uh, that you know, after some initial hiccups, uh, over the summer, the EU passed a, a pretty massive uh, relief package totaling nearly a trillion dollars. Uh, and much of that went to the countries that were hit hardest. Uh, Italy, for example, got um, some $200 billion. So thank you to all of our UM and Florida International University students for their very insightful questions. Thank you all panelists for your very interesting remarks and also for your responses to my students' questions and Dr. Thiel's students' questions. We really appreciate your taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to young people and talk to the people out there watching this video. If you're interested in learning more about the German-American friendship and the challenges that these two countries are facing in the 21st century, I'd encourage you to watch some of our earlier roundtables, which are available on our YouTube channel through the link that you can see on your screen. Thank you all very much for attending today, and I wish everyone continued health and safety.